So please uh, try to do for yourselves uh, um, the problems that I, guys, uh, that I uh, posted on the website, right, that we are doing now. And please try to do as many problems from the textbook as possible, right? <coughs> Excuse me. So next week, even though it's break, I'll have regular office hours as usual on Monday and Tuesday. And I'll also have, excuse me, <coughs> I'll also have office hours on Friday for people who panic, right? So, but don't wait until Friday, um, please. And I might get uh, actually a classroom because usually just before the exam I have uh, tons of students coming that cannot fit into my office. Uh, okay, so let us look at a few um, problems that are solved by uh, greedy, uh, the greedy strategy. So assume that in a country, anyone knows where Albonia is? Never heard of Albonia? You don't read the Dilbert, uh, the car cartoon? It's a very kind of, uh, very funny about corporate life that awaits you, so I recommend it wholeheartedly. So in Albania, the coins are 81 cent, uh, 27 cents, uh, 9 cents, uh, 3 cents, and 1 cent. Show that <coughs> greedy strategy works uh, uh, in the sense that uh, it returns the minimal number of coins uh, for any amount. So that's very similar to the example with uh, Australian coins, but in this case, it's a little bit even simpler, right? So assume that there, is for, that there exists certain amount M, right, uh, for which uh, there is a better way with fewer coins uh, to give amount M uh, than what greedy provides, uh, right? Well, <coughs> if it's better than greedy, then obviously it couldn't have been constructed using the greedy strategy that uh, we described. So it must be, as you give this change, it must be, there must be a step in which greedy was violated, right? And let's assume that it was, because it's just shorter argument if you assume that it was violated uh, with some other coin. Um, uh, let's assume that it was uh, uh, violated uh, uh, already with 81 cent coin. What does it mean? Well, it means that you have a mount M that is bigger or equal than 81 cents. But you decided not to use any more uh, 81 cent coins, right? Uh, this means that you have on your disposal only these coins, 27 to 1 cent. Now, how many 27 coins can be used to give this amount M if the strategy is optimal? Hmm? Only at most two, right? At most two, because if you had three coins of 27 cents, you could replace it with another coin of 81 cents. So if the, uh, if the amount is given by the f as few coins as possible, you cannot have more than 27 cents, uh, more than two 27 cent coins. But 81 minus twice uh, 27 is bigger or equal than 27, right? So after you use all available 27 coins, you end up with amount that is bigger or equal than 27 cents, and you can no longer use uh, 27 cent coin. Again, the same story. Nine cent coins, you can have at most two, because if you had three nine cent coins, you could replace them with a single 27 cent coins. 
So you end up with bigger or equal than nine cents, and you cannot use more nine cents coins. You can again use at most two three cent coins. So that's six cents, and you are left with bigger or equal than three cents, and only one set at your disposal, but we, you need at least three one set coins, one cent coins, which can be replaced by a single three cent coins, thus the, um, the amount given is not, cannot be optimal. So it's a typical, uh, one of the typical strategies for proving that greedy produces optimal solution. You assume that there is something better. If it's better, it couldn't have been produced by greedy. You find the first place where greedy is violated and then somehow you derive either a, uh, you derive a contradiction, right? So it's a very typical uh, example of how to argue informally but rigorously that uh, greedy produces optimal solution. So how about other coin uh, sets of coins? Can you give example of a set of coins when greedy uh, doesn't work? Right, only special combinations uh, of uh, coins allow greedy to be optimal. If you have something strange like one cent, uh, say uh, 17 cents, 19 cents, and uh, uh, say uh, 21 cent, and the amount that you want to give is 26 cents, uh, then Greedy would ask you to take 21 cent coin and you are left with five cents to give and you would have to use five of these. Altogether six when just these two clearly satisfy for this. So for this, sorry? Oh, 36, sorry. 36. Well, again, the same. Uh, 36 minus uh, 21 is uh, 15, right? So even worse, you would need 15 of these. Okay, so um, it is possible to give optimal, uh, uh, to return always with a minimal number of coins for any amount and any uh, denominations, but uh, greedy doesn't work. We need something called dynamic programming um, that, uh, but you will see that what dynamic programming produces is not truly uh, feasible. By the way, as I wrote on this, uh, if uh, on the exam, if you are not given an explicit bound, if you are not, for example, asked to produce an algorithm that runs in time n log n, uh, then you, uh, the, it means just give a feasible solution. Now, feasible solution is any solution that runs in polynomial time. What's polynomial time? Where t of n is polynomial if and only if it is O of n to the k, where k is a fixed integer. If k is equal to 1, you get linear. If k is equal to 2, you get quadratic and so forth. So you can have arbitrarily large but fixed exponent. And the uh, purpose of this is just to rule out brute force. Because usually brute force works in exponential time, 2 to the n, or even worse, for example, n factorial if you would have to examine all permutations of n elements. Okay, Let, oh, here is an interesting one. Uh, so assume that you are given n tasks which all take the same uh, unit amount of time and each task, so you have task T1, it takes one, say one hour to finish it, unit amount of time, but uh, task T1, it has a deadline di and penalty pi, so this is task ti, and you have task, say, t1 up to tn. 
And the idea is uh, that, and you are of course given, so if you look at these uh, deadlines, uh, um, the, the, uh, you can start with uh, at certain, say, zero instant of time, and then you have, say, deadline uh, D1, D2, uh, say here is D3, here is D5, and so forth. You can do only one task at a time. Your goal is to schedule how you will do the tasks so that you pay minimal amount of total penalty. And you pay penalty PI if you do not complete the task by the deadline DI. Right? So you are given a whole bunch of deadlines, for example, for your assignments. And you are given a bunch of penalties, like, you know, five days in confinement or being sent to Siberia or you can be as imaginative as you want. So you have to choose the order in which you will do the tasks so that the total amount of penalty is as small as possible. How would you do that? So which task should you try to do first? One that has the earliest deadline or one that has the highest that, uh, penalty? Well, assume that, say, task um, five has the earliest deadline, uh, but uh, task D, uh, D uh, okay, so say task D5 has the largest penalty, but, no, 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 this is not what I want. Uh, so the largest penalty is, say, uh, task three. Um, and uh, uh, you decide to do it first, so you would do T3 here, but now there is no time to do task with deadline D5. On the other hand, if you first do task <laughs> Uh, D5 with the earliest deadline, maybe you will fill the space and uh, some expensive tasks will be left unfilled. So how do you resolve this dichotomy that you want to do tasks with early deadlines earlier, but also tasks with large penalty to do them on time because they cost you a lot? Hmm? How would you choose in what order to execute the tasks? So clearly, you don't want to get stuck with not having done the task that is most expensive. But you don't want this execution of this task to mess up uh, something also reasonably expensive, but because there is no time to do it. So, you do first the most expensive task, but when do you do it? When do you schedule it? You do it, and this even has a name. Uh, it's called just in time. You take the most expensive task and you execute it just before its deadline. Because in this way, you minimally affect um, you leave as much as possible time to do other tasks, right? Now, say there is another task that is quite expensive and it had exactly the same deadline as D2. When do you execute it? In general, if you scheduled K tasks, you take K plus first task with K plus first largest penalty but its slot is filled, when do you execute it? Before, but when? It just? just exactly. You execute it as late as possible. So first available, the, the latest available empty spot before uh, its deadline. So in this way, you balance, you make sure that uh, all the that initial segment of all tasks 
will be executed from most expensive down, and you uh, maintain minimal kind of conflict. Okay. So, uh, by the way, I will post the solutions of these problems, uh, brief solutions, but say at the end of the week or early next week, because I want you to go home and try to do them again completely on your own, because you got hints here, right? Uh, uh, but by the end of the week or early next week, you will have written solutions for this, which I'm sure you will distribute uh, for the next year for your peers, even though you shouldn't, but yes. Then you might, yeah, you can execute it at the very end because there is no, uh, you, you know, you will fill all the slots and then uh, there is, these, the remaining tasks will be uh, executed after they, their deadlines. Okay, so, because there is no penalty for how late you execute it for as long as it's past the deadline. Okay, so here is another interesting uh, problem that can be done in two ways. Uh, it sounds a little bit silly, but it's a good example of greedy, so let's look at it. So you have a row of, say, stalls or houses or what barn, whatever you want. And of course, they are all in Albania where things are a little bit strange. And some of the stalls have damaged roofs. Okay. And there are heaps of them, say 111. Now, the building regulations in Albania are a little bit strange because of safety concerns. You are allowed to use only, say, um, 11 boards. Boards can be of arbitrary length, but you can only use 11 chunks of wood to put on top of the stalls. Your task is to cover all the holes but so that the sum total length of the wood that you will use is as small as possible. How would you do that? How would you cover all the holes with 11? Yes? Sorry? No, no moving roots, uh, no moving roofs. You can just put pieces of wood on top, no creative solutions. <laughs> How would you do it? <laughs> Who, uh, which are the? Aha, <laughs> uh -huh. so one way of doing it, uh, you connect two that are as close to each other as possible. But you don't declare this, that this is one piece yet. Then uh, you connect next two that are as close as possible. And uh, how do we proceed from there? Then we treat this as a single piece. If the next slot is here and we join this, so we try to join them. Minimizing distances in between. That's one way of doing it. How would you do it totally the other way around? If you start with just one single piece, so this piece has to be, say, this long to cover all the holes. What do you do next? Exactly. You look where is the largest gap and you cut it out, and now you have two pieces. 
Then you look again, where is the largest gap? You cut it out and you get three pieces and so forth until you reach 11 and then you have to stop, right? So sometimes problems can be solved from top bottom or from bottom up. So you can either start joining holes that are closest in proximity, considering uh, these guys as a single, <coughs> single unit. But it's kind of cleaner if you do it from one big chunk and then excising uh, the unnecessary slots. Okay, here is another nice problem. So you are running a small manufacturing shop with plenty of workers, uh, uh, but with a single milling machine. You have to produce N items. Uh, for each item, um, say item K, you know it's machining time MK and it's polishing time PK, right? You have to schedule in which order, uh, first you have to machine the piece and then your workers polish it, uh, right? So in which order would you um, do the, the uh, would you manufacture the items so that you finish the whole job as early as possible. So now you have again two constraints. You have machining time and you have polishing time. And the problem with the machining time is uh, if you start machining something that takes long time, then your workers have to wait until it comes off the machine to polish it. So what do you think, in what order should we do the... Ah, I was trying to deceive you, deviously, uh, but uh, the answer is correct. Uh, so even though it looks that uh, you should order them by as short machining time as possible. Actually, you order them by their polishing time only, without regard on machining time. Why is this a good strategy? Well, I think you can have the mill running continuously, is that right? That's right. So whichever uh, order you mill them in, the milling is going to take the same amount of time. Very good. So first observation is uh, in no matter what order you machine the items, they will take fixed amount of time, right? Now, you have also the polishing times, right? Well, if you want the polishing time to protrude as little as possible, you should give yourself as much time as possible starting the polishing as early as possible, right? Because your delay will be entirely determined by how far the longest polishing time uh, protrudes, right? So you will order them just in terms of the polishing time and ignore machining time altogether. So you see sometimes it's kind of first guess is might not be the best one. Sometimes things are a little bit counterintuitive on the first side, but uh, when you think a little bit more, they make sense. So in this case, order them just by polishing time. Okay. So you see, greedy are not, once you uh, do enough of them, uh, you, you get really a good gut feeling what will work. Okay, uh, am I going blind or there is no eraser here? Oh, well. Yes. Oh, man, I'm on a tether. I cannot get there. Can you help me? Thank you very much. Okay, um, so 
Let's see. Next one. Okay, here is a very interesting one. So you have, you remember our interval scheduling, right? When you have a large classroom and uh, you have a bunch of people wanting to give lectures and you want to schedule as many of them so that they don't overlap. Well, assume that actually this classroom is in operation 24 hours a day. So you get requests that can go across the day line. So this is 12 a.m. and you have one request like this, another request like that, and so forth. So you have a whole bunch of mutually overlapping requests, and you need now to choose the largest number of these arcs that, that, uh, that consists entirely of uh, non-overlapping arcs. How would you do this problem? The shortest first, you remember the uh, interval scheduling on line, if you do the shortest first, you can get in trouble. So, what's the difference between this uh, situation and that situation? There is no end here. Well, if you set the end here, you might rule out this guy and maybe this guy is in fact used in the optimal solution. How would you solve this problem? If you knew, if you could, if there was a, a time interval that no arc covers, what could you do then? You just cut it open there and solve exactly the same problem. But what happens if uh, every point on the circle is covered by several intervals? What do you have to do? Well, which ones do we remove? Maybe we remove ones that partake in the optimal solution. So the, uh, the moral of this problem is try to reduce it to something that you know how to do it. So how would you reduce it to this linear problem? Yes? Very good. Brilliant. So what you do, you take a bunch of, you pick any point whatsoever, right? And you look at all intervals that contain that point. You pick one of them uh, and uh, cut the time open at the very beginning of that interval, solve the problem, see how many intervals you get. Then you take another one, right, cut it open where it starts and uh, solve the problem. And you repeat this with all intervals, right? Because any interval, you have to guarantee that you take into account solutions that contain an arbitrary interval. So you will solve n many problems of this kind, right? And um, and take the optimal one. Okay. So, do you have to really test for all intervals? 
if I pick a point and I test only for all intervals that contain that point, should that be enough? Right? Yes, because uh, the solution contains non-overlapping intervals and you try all of these as possibilities, but you should also test when you take none of these, right? Because uh, maybe optimal solution doesn't contain either of these intervals. Okay, so you, if there are k intervals above x, you should do k plus one solutions, starting with each of the overlapping, of each interval containing x and with none of them to make sure that uh, you, th yes. Yeah, so if you want to optimize this, uh, but uh, this would be kind of, yeah, how would you efficiently implement uh, looking how many, I guess you could do a search uh, to find what's the, play, uh, the spot that contains the fewest number of, uh, that, that is contained in the fewest number of intervals, yes. So you can do a first a search where, where you should pick this, uh, this point. Okay, so here is the next problem. How about the similar problem in which you have again your a pole and you have a bunch of overlapping posters and you want to stab them all? How would you solve this problem? So we had the same problem on a line when we had, just like here, a bunch of overlapping intervals, but this time, rather than looking for the largest disjoint set, now we want to use as few needles as possible, but to make sure that all intervals are stabbed. How do you solve this problem? Well, the trouble is, uh, you remember this example, three here, and three here, and then two here, and two here, and two here, and two here. If you stab them here, right, you will have to stab them also here and here to catch these two, but now this is not needed. But again, the trick is the same. We know how to do it uh, on a line, rather than on a circle. How would you reduce uh, this problem by, uh, to a problem on a line? Yeah? How do you reduce this problem to the problem on a line? So what is the same method as before? Exactly. So. Simply pick any of the intervals, stab it at the very end, and continue doing it, right? That's, you count how many needles you used, then you pick the next interval, stab it at the end, and continue just as in the line, count how many needles, and then take max, sorry, take uh, uh, mean of all the solutions. Now, this problem can be also solved in time n log n rather than quadratic here because we repeat a linear procedure. Um, well, here we, com we complete n times, but we have to sort the intervals uh, in the increasing ending uh, time, for example. So that would be n log n, and then you have to repeat this search procedure n times, so uh, that would be, um, well, so it would be n log n plus um, n times n, so n squared procedure. But it can be done in time n log n. You might want to play uh, with this. Okay, so let's see what we can do 
next. So how about uh, this one? So you have a, a chip, right? That, uh, with a circuit that looks like a binary tree. So say this is a sequence of some logical gates. Um, and for each, this you can think of as a piece of wire. And say you have here a bunch of flip-flops or whatever, something else. And this is your clock, right? And it sends clock pulses. And for each line, you know its length that determines the delay. So say this is uh, three units, this is five units, this is two units, this is seven units. This is one, this is three, this is five, this is one unit. But the problem is that you have to receive the clock pulse in all the leaves simultaneously. So the only way to make sure, and obviously not all branches propagate with the same speed. Some of them are faster, some of them are slower, okay? And you want to make sure, in order to make sure that the, all of these guys will be triggered exactly at the same instant, you have to increase uh, the delay along some of the branches. But you want to do it in such a way that some total of increases uh, is as small as possible. So you want to increase uh, the delays uh, along uh, uh, these edges, but uh, so that, the, that some total of all increases is as small as possible. How would you do that? So one way would be uh, you find what's the max delay, right? Then you consider this subtree, and you consider this subtree, and uh, what do you do next? So you see what is the sum of this delay, what is the sum of that delay, and then you change uh, only one of these. But now the problem is uh, these two guys might not have the same delay uh, inside here. So how do you uh, how do you solve this problem? It's possible to do it that way, but it is messy. Uh, usually things are easier handled from bottom up. How would you solve this problem from bottom up? Hmm? So first of all, uh, you want to make sure that when a pulse arrives here, it takes exactly the same amount of time to, do, to propagate from both branches. So you take the max of the two and you increase it uh, to match this one. You do the same here, you make this five. How do you reconcile now this subtree and that subtree, what do you do next? So now this is five, this is three, this is seven, this is two, what do you do next? So seven and five, the delay here is, uh, uh, it's 12. The delay here is three and two is five. So the difference is seven. So what do you do, which branch do you change? The left one, you make it into, uh, 
is it nine, right? Nine and three will be 12. And you keep now, you do the same with this subtree. Uh, you compute the delay here, the delay here, and again, you change only one of them. And this would produce the optimal solution. Okay, how about this one? You want to build a minimal spanning tree, but minimal in the following sense, that the weight of the, that the largest weight in the tree is as small as possible. So we are not minimizing the sum of the weights, but we want to build a spanning tree so that the largest weight is as small as possible. How would you do that? Okay, let's hear more people. Very good, but I have to kind of wake, the, uh, wake up the rest. Come on, people. Did you have coffee? Next time I'll bring everyone coffee. <laughs> I'll bring one of these machines here, and then... Uh, and the coffee will be better than in the coffee shop, but it'll cost you 10 bucks. <laughs> okay, so let's see. Um, so how would you build a minimum spanning tree where minimum is defined that the weight, the largest weight in the tree is small, as small as possible? That would be one way of doing it, but uh, um, let's try to do it in the fashion that... Uh, uh, the, how the algorithm for constructing minimum spanning tree uh, works. Yes? Mm -hmm. So what are you describing, actually? It's classical theorem, a classical method, exactly the same method also produces minimal spanning tree e with this second uh, condition, of course, because you will not add, right, uh, you always try to add as light edge as possible, and of course, this will not only minimize the sum, it will also minimize the, um, the max of the edges. Okay. Now, if, how would you prove uh, that if all the weights are distinct, uh, there can be, at most, there can be exactly one minimum spanning tree. If all the weights are distinct, why is it the case that there can be only one spanning tree? The algorithm, uh, Crystal's algorithm, always produces the minimum one, and it, it uh, obviously does it by, by always choosing the, the smallest weight that connects to disconnected parts. Well, if there was another disconnected, sorry, if there was another minimum spanning tree, it would have to differ. And the only way it could differ is by having, uh, having um, an edge which is actually bigger than one of the edges it was in fact used. Excellent. So the argument is if there are two minimum spanning trees, at least one of them doesn't fit the classical construction. So you start running the classical construction and you look for the first place, the first instant, when you do not add the next cheapest tree. Then you continue with, the, then you consider this non-classical tree and you add this edge, right? Now you will have a loop if you add this edge. Now in that loop, not all of the edges could come before that edge. 
because that edge is a legitimate edge to add using Kraskow construction. So at least one edge was added after, that is after in the list than this edge. But because all edges are of different uh, uh, weights, this must be strictly more expensive edge than this. You remove it and voila, you get a spanning tree with smaller weight than the second allegedly optimal spanning tree. Okay, good. So let's see another one. Okay, here is a nice one that people find confusing. So Alice wants to throw a party and she has her list of friends and she has all pairs of who knows whom, right? Because she hacked into the Facebook and, uh, <laughs> you know. Oh, she didn't have to hack. Facebook would sell it to her. <laughs> Okay, so she wants to invite as many people as possible, but to make her party success, she wants to, invite, she wants to make sure that at the party, every person will know at least five other people, and every person will also not know at least five people. And she wants to choose as many people as possible. How would she do that? So here, is, here are her friends and we join them if they know each other. So what you want is that uh, every participant in the party has at least five people on that party that uh, this person knows, but also there are at least five people there without the edges. So how would she choose the largest number of people uh, while maintaining this condition to be true? So you create a connected graph, mm -hmm. right? and you can throw out all the people that know less than five people, because they can't make it into the party to begin with. Very good. So you look you make the graph of all her friends, connecting those that know each other, and you throw out, you like to throw out people? <laughs> <laughs> and you eliminate. Let's use nicer <laughs> euphemisms. Eliminate people. Uh, you disqualify, that's the word. You disqualify everyone who knows fewer then five people, because obviously they cannot fit. Whom else can you disqualify as well? Exactly. If you will eliminate also those you wanted to propose? Okay, so first you remove these five people, very good. So you disqualify these five people. So now the count uh, of some people might drop. So there might be new people now that know less than, that, uh, know less than five of the remaining, right? But whom else do you have to eliminate? People that knew too much. Even the governments don't like such people. <laughs> so uh, you also have to eliminate everyone who knows almost everyone. Uh, so there, is only, there are only four people of le or less who they do not know. So you keep eliminating those that knew too much and those that uh, uh, knew too little, right? And at the end, uh, if the you know, if the process ends up with zero, no party, right? Or it will stop at one point and this will be your maximal 
uh, set. Okay, I think this gives you a good uh, idea about greedy. As I said, please try to do as many problems for the, from the book as possible. Office hours next week.